knees into a cell. Now we've got this incredibly complicated an, uh, mechanism, and it's very specific. So those two things. So the which one's more important out of the attachment or the once your DNA is into the cell, where where the most intense limitation happens? Yeah. Okay. So that's okay. So the question is: Is it the primary defenses or the secondary mm -hmm. defenses that are the most important? I don't <coughs> think there's any real way to either weigh that or to even to differentiate it. Okay. We know that. There's a lot of uh, selection on the viruses at all steps, right? So it's often hard for them to get in. If you were to look, um, the evidence that we have, I'd say is almost equal, okay. right? So the, the most obvious ones are the restriction enzymes are amazingly, like phage are so biased against certain restriction enzyme uh, sites, it's crazy, right? And they spend all this time modifying their DNA so that they can't be cut by restriction enzymes. Like this is a, one of the main things that's ubiquitous and obvious in phage genomes. Yeah. Okay. So I would say that probably restriction enzymes would be the main thing that's happening out there. The stuff that, the secondary stuff, you could watch it happen in a lab, right? You can do the, uh, I'm sorry, the primary defenses, you can see that happen in the lab really easily. These are some classical experiments by Lin Chow and stuff like that, where, uh, and actually a whole bunch of them, but basically where you attack with a phage and then you watch uh, the bacteria change its, its uh, outside and then you watch the phage change it and, and they just keep doing that. Because then I was asking, if, if I'm a virus and I have such a simple agenda, all I want to do is get DNA into a cell, and yet all of a sudden I'm acting complexly, does that mean that essentially all that... So it's like the, the lion's teeth are being driven to evolve by the change in the zebra. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Uh-huh. So you've gone from a simple idea to a complex mechanism, which must be all driven by the cell. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. That's exactly That's the, check that. the type of evolutionary dynamics you're dealing with. Right? Okay, so it's uh, not really a lion and a zebra anymore. It's, it's Everything's yeah. morphing everything. Right. Okay. And it's that, you know, that quote of, you know, it's... Uh, bloody and tooth and claw, well as, you know, bloody tail fibers at <laughs> and CRISPR elements or something, right? Because <laughs> it's actually, that's the war, and that war is really fast. Remember all that data I showed you? This is happening, like, all the time, uh, like, at really vast numbers. So this is more like, it's kind of biology playing right at the realm of chemistry, right? There are molar amounts of this stuff happening. So the difference with the zebra and the, uh, and the, uh, Lion is that it's not anywhere close, right? It's literally, you know, <coughs> 10 to 15 less events, and we can still see it happen there. So you can imagine how precise it is. And that's why the viral information, why that selection pressure may be so low, and we may be able to observe it in the, the viral parts. Okay. So the the argument is is that uh, as it, which is that it costs more for the bacteria to change the receptors uh, because those are often things that are stuck out so that they can eat, okay? But that's actually been disproven in lots of systems. So it's not always that it is, um, that it's a negative for them. There's actually different pathways they can go and change their receptor system. So yes, that's the, the, the argument, but I'm not sure that that holds up all the time, or it doesn't hold up a lot of the time. All right. Um, so the other part of this, and for the evolutionary stuff of where I want to get us going, is um, really the, the other part of all of this is all we've been talking about are living behavior, right? And that's a little biased because when we look in uh, the marine environment, we see mostly evidence of living behavior, okay? That, that's the dynamics that we're looking at. But essentially all cells are actually uh, um, lysogens, right? Okay, and that's us as well as a bacteria cell, right? They're all carrying some version of proviruses out there. And if you really want, uh, this is, I, I think, a really good book because this is one of the first times where uh, someone just put together and just uh, put all of this together and said, how many retroviruses are we carrying? How many retro elements are we carrying? Uh, how many are bacteria carrying? How are these mechanisms, transposons, plasmids, uh, and phages moving around in the system. So this is a really good uh, number place right here. And um, we know that these things are uh, 
are, at least the pro-viruses are playing major uh, games, and that's why they know. So those of you, just to get this stuff correct, so this is adsorption, right? So do you guys know this term? So adsorption means what? Sticking to. So what's the difference between it and absorption? Since you're all nodding your head and you obviously know it, and what's the difference? Adsorption is sticking to something, and absorption is when you get incorporated with something. Exactly. So absorption is becoming part of, right? And then the, this is the infection. And then, of course, the two life cycles. And this gets a little complicated because you've got the lytic one, which is, of course, when it just makes a whole bunch of itself and blows up the house, okay? And then you've got the ability, this temperate life cycle, okay, where you form a lysogen. Okay, and people can be somewhat picky about this type. So the host with a pro-virus in it, or a pro-agent in it, is called the lysogen. And we say lysogenic, but some people don't like that. They would say, prefer that you talk about temperate lifestyles, okay? And then, of course, this is the classical, you know, uh, most of the time we think of it as integrating into the host as a pro-virus. It can replicate as a plasmid. It can replicate as a transposon. There's a whole bunch of different ways it does it. Lambda is the classical one. And then eventually there's some induction event. What's the way that we normally induce in the lab? Mitomycin. Yeah, mitomycin. But uh, Lance, what's the thing that's better now? Carbidox. Carbidox, yeah. So this was found by these uh, uh, animal uh, scientists studying uh, phages. And it's much cheaper, so we're going to use that nowadays. Um, right, and these things actually change, can completely change the phenotype of the host, right? So the difference between Vibrio cholera out in the environment and the Vibrio cholera that kills you, right, is only a phage carrying the CTX. Yes? Can I, okay, so a prophage that's induced and produces a whole bunch of progeny, uh -huh. they're still lysogenic, correct? Sorry, I don't understand. So, a prophage that's induced uh -huh. that comes out of the cell, those viral progenies are looking to integrate back into a host, not they, lytic. They can become temperate again. Yes. If 90 would, I mean, yes. is this like 90% of the time would they integrate back in? Uh, no, most of the time they would actually just go through another lytic cycle. So that, that, and again, this isn't perfect, right? Not everybody, uh, yeah. but if you, do, uh, if you do lambda literature, right, um, to get the integration cycle, right, they've actually manipulated how often you get the integration versus the lytic cycle. And you can totally screw with that. So that's one of those timing things that is completely both the uh, uh, insertion and the excision cycles um, can be manipulated very precisely. Hmm. And probably are, because you can, you can imagine a whole range of uh, places where you'd want to integrate most of the time. And you think or, that, yeah. that applies to environmental hmm. page populations? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. 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 I've read that, hmm. um, I don't know if it's a, just a story, or, but that could be interesting in the context of what I'm doing. The nicotine can put uh, phage back into lytic cycle? Is it something yeah. you're, okay. Yeah, definitely. There's a whole, uh, and there's a whole bunch of things that the common element that most people have seen is that DNA damage of some sort will help okay. the phage, will cause the phage to induce. Okay. So anything that does DNA damage um, is a good inducing agent. So and that's probably because the viruses, when they're sitting in here, if that cell is dying because of too much DNA damage, oh, okay. right? So it's it, it's I mean, got to so get the hell out. Yeah. It's going to like endure it. Okay. Yeah, and the other possibility is that um, when you uh, another virus, in it. so if you're a prophage and you get attacked by mm -hmm. a lytic one, one of the first things it does is start chopping up the genome. Mm -hmm. So it's suicide <laughs> to stay in there. Okay. okay? Yeah. So then. They jump out, okay, and that's probably why there's so much recombination between different phages, because when they start doing that, there's actually like sticky ends and double strand breaks and stuff, all just floating around in this mixture of stuff, okay. and so your chances of getting a recombinant is actually is much mm -hmm. higher, yeah, okay. okay, and they can also pick up pieces of the host uh, DNA that way too. 
So when you say this, the sensitive to environmental variation, do you mean like directly or indirectly? Like they're waiting for the cell to get stressed and that's how they're sensing environmental change? Yeah. Or they're looking for, there are specific things happening, <laughs> like right, triggering so the, of a the, gene. The problem is, is that, that the way that we normally think of it in the lab, we usually think of it as um, the rats leaving the sinking ship mm -hmm. sort of thing, okay? But they also reasons sink the reasons to believe that the thing they're actually doing is holding on uh, because it, as a very on, they did, they may be more susceptible to breaking over time. They may be actually better off to stay in the cell as it goes, when there's a lot of fat. What would you call it, when they're starving to death, mm -hmm. right? So what they might actually be doing, and we had some evidence of this in roseophage, and we never followed up. But the, uh, basically, you can imagine that they hold on as the cell gets sicker and sicker, and the cell accumulates DNA damage, but it doesn't fix it. Mm -hmm. Right, which is what they do when they're starving, and then as soon as you get a hold of some food, the cell starts to grow. They start to fix our DNA. The phage is cued on DNA damage. It's like ah, screw it. Now I'm out of here because the cell is growing and it blows up. So it may be just the opposite of how mm -hmm. we actually think about mm -hmm. it. Does that make sense? So you fix the ship and then they sink it. Exactly. You just blow 